All right, hey, good morning. We are going through the book of Joshua, and we're at the point in Joshua where it's halfway through. Joshua is 24 chapters in length, and um, we are at chapter 13, so the second half of the book. And it divides really nicely because the first half is about them entering the land, taking the land, and the second half of the book is about dividing the inheritance in the land. So open your Bibles up to Joshua chapter 13. And a few more introduction points before we uh, pray and dig in here. But um, what happens now is there's detail about the 12 tribes entering into their inheritance. Uh, lots of detail about it. And remember that Israel, they were pilgrims and sojourners. That They were given that promise, their father Abraham, 600 years before that they would inherit that land. And then uh, it came to Jacob, and then uh, they went down to... Uh, they went down through uh, Joseph to Egypt, and for 400 years, they were about 400 in Egypt, and many of those years they were slaves. So here they've got this great promise, and the promise is that they would inherit this land, and yet they're not even there. But God is building this nation, and um, they come out of Egypt as God brought them out. And remember this. God brought them out, it says in Deuteronomy, so that he might bring them in. He brought them out in order to bring them in. So in Joshua, we've seen that. God is fighting the battles. Uh, they've seen that it's huge. It's miraculous what God has done. Only things that God, to, God could do, bringing them across the Jordan, defeating the different kings and so forth. And they're learning to fight by faith and inherit by faith. Now it's time to take that inheritance. So in the second half of Joshua... The word inheritance, at least in the New King James, is 58 times in the whole book, 56 in the second half. 56 times inheritance, 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 which is huge. So we'll be talking a lot about that. Um, and it ties in God's promises and the inheritance. Those tie, up, tie in together because they are to take their inheritance by faith in his promises. You know, if someone gives you a promise, it's only as good as as their character is, really. If someone gave me a promise, you know, of, of some financial inheritance, but they actually didn't have that to give, well, they can say it all they want, but it's no good, right? Um, so God makes the promise. And is he good for it? He makes the promise of this inheritance to them. Is he good for it? Yes, he is. It's time for them to take it, even though it's 600 years later. So let's pray and then begin in chapter 13. Lord, we thank you for your word. Uh, God, we pray that today you'd make it fresh to us. And we thank you for it being like manna, Lord. And uh, just give us double portions that we may feed off of it, that we may feed off your promises, that we may know you more, Lord, and that uh, we would rejoice in all that we have in the blessings in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. So. Uh, chapter 13 of Joshua, and in verse 1, it says, Now Joshua was old, advanced in years, and the Lord said to him, You are old, advanced in years, and there remained very much land to be possessed. Yeah, funny, right? It is funny. Uh, God, God says to him, he's speaking to his leader, Joshua, and Joshua is now 100 years old, 100 years old, and the Lord says to him, there remains very much land yet to be possessed. There's still a lot to do, a lot of work to do. And so at the beginning here, God's giving Joshua direction. You know, Moses was 120 years old. Moses was still ready to go. Moses said he felt like he was 80. He felt like he was ready to just keep taking what God had for him. It was amazing. And, and yet, Moses' day was done. The Lord knew that, and the Lord told him that, no, Moses, you're not going into the land. Joshua is 100 years old, but Joshua feels it. It says here, you are old and advanced in years. You are advanced in years. That just doesn't mean you're old in number, but the idea behind that advanced in years is not time, but it means time has taken its toll on you. So in a real common vernacular, it would have been like, you're old, and it shows. Time has taken its toll on you. And you could see that he was he was haggard through the years. That's the idea of it. And yet, there's a lot of work for him still to do. Moses was 
120 and he felt like he was ready to go still and yet his work was done. Joshua, he feels his, his age and yet there's still a lot to do. You know, we don't know what the Lord has for each of us. It's always different. And there are seasons that can feel like years. Um, there are years that can feel like decades. Uh, I've heard, heard people comment on presidents of the United States. Um, Abraham Lincoln being a, an obvious one where going into the presidency, he looked uh, his age, coming out of it, he looked 20 years older. You know, and you can see that with a lot of different presidents. Uh, the prime minister, I don't know, Justin Trudeau went into it, you know, and they want someone fresh, you know, young looking, vibrant looking. Maybe they want him a little wiser in their later years. So Justin's got the nice beard going, some eagle feathers I've seen going on there. Maybe just to relate to COVID times. Anyway, I don't know. But you know what I'm talking about. When years are, are difficult, have been difficult, and there is a, is a difficult aging that's gone on, that's Joshua. And he's feeling it, but yet there's more to do. And God has a plan for all of us. He knows when our work is complete. God knows when, um, when the work is finished. And only he knows that. And, and he, may he, he will empower us to do his work. We need to keep our eyes on the prize. So here's Joshua. Joshua still needs to divide the land up. And there's still very much land to possess. In verse 2 of chapter 13, down through 6, it speaks about... Um, some of the land that they still haven't possessed. It speaks about the Philistines. Now, the Philistines are going to be a plague in Israel's side for years to come. Uh, they still, they never were able to fully uproot them. But it speaks about that land, and I'm not going to go through every uh, detail of all the words here. But then um, in 6, it says, all the inhabitants of, of Lebanon. It just speaks about all these locations, Sidonians. And I'll drive them out. I will drive them out. It says in verse 6 in the second half. I will drive them out before the children of Israel, only divide it by lot to the to Israel as an inheritance, as I have commanded you, and divide it. So the Lord says, there's a lot of work to do. I will do it. I will drive them out. You need to divide the lands by lot to the tribes now. It's, that, it's at that time. The major campaigning wars are done, central, south, and north. And so now... They are to divide it by lot, and and they are to um, they are to uh, take what God has given them, has promised to them. And there's a lot of, by the way, in this and in in the coming chapters, there's a lot of geographical descriptions that would mean a lot to an ancient Israelite. Um, they don't mean as much to us because we're not as aware of this of that land. But if it would be for us, it would be like something like, oh, and from from. You know, the corner of Admirals at Gorge to Uptown, down to, to James Bay, over to, you know, Naden. That means something to us where we live. You know, if, if you're watching this and you're not from Victoria, what I just said doesn't mean anything to you, right? So it's it means a lot to the Israelite in that day. And actually, Joshua is a governing document. What they're reading there, they would have had to refer to in time to come as a governing document of the boundaries and the territories and the cities that belong to who and where. Like, it, it was, that's an amazing thing, right? But for us who are far off, not so much. So we'll breeze through some of that, and I know that you'll probably take the time to read it, right? Um, so there's still land to take, but God promises he will drive them out. You know, <clears throat> my part, your part, is to continue to take what God has for us, what God has for us. It's God's part to do the work of, of empowering that, of driving it, driving out. Like think about our sanctification. Think about our walk with the Lord. Um, I, am, I am to continue walking with the Lord, but it's by God's grace that I'm changed. It's by God's grace that I'm sanctified. You know, it's not by my stressing. It's not by my, my pressing and, you know, thinking about a tree that's going to bear fruit. You know, it's not trying, you know, it needs to receive the nutrients. It needs to be planted by the rivers of water, and that fruit will be produced. So God's the one that does the work. He fights the battles, right? To, and, and, and yet we're to take by his grace those things that are ours in him. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a joining with the Lord in that work. So in verse 8 of chapter 13, 
the division of the land uh, begins and it's got again a lot of details here. It talks first about um, the land east of the Jordan, which was already promised and given to the two and a half tribes that wanted that. Uh, Reuben, Gad, and half of Manasseh, half of the tribe of Manasseh. They wanted the land east of the Jordan before they even crossed in, before the book of Joshua began. And so there's a little bit of a recap that goes on there. And in verse 14, it says, only to the tribe of Levi, he gave no inheritance. The sacrifices of the Lord God of Israel made by fire are their inheritance, as he said to them. So you'll see that throughout. And then in chapter 21 and 20 and 21, it all talks about Levites and their inheritance. And it's just a beautiful, wonderful picture there that they would have cities amidst all of the tribes. I think 40 something cities, but we'll get to that. So the, the Lord is their inheritance. There's that word inheritance again, 56 times in chapter 13, moving on forward inheritance promises and inheritance tied together. Inheritance is that portion that is promised to them. God has an inheritance promised to all that are in him. And, and they were to be stewards over that inheritance. And they were to be stewards. Uh, um, really, it's being a steward over the promises, believing the promises. It's how you're a good steward of it. And uh, being a steward over the inheritance of, of when it's given to you and you're, you're to possess it. Now, verse 15 through 23 in chapter 13 goes into uh, Reuben. Uh, Reuben's inheritance, again, east of the Jordan. And if you looked at a map, Reuben would be south um, by the Dead Sea, and then it's going to go north. Uh, so if you've got the, red, uh, the, the Jordan, and then you've got the Mediterranean over here, you've got the Dead Sea at the bottom and Galilee up here. So Reuben's down here in the corner, and it speaks about their land. And then it goes up, uh, mentions Balaam by there, by the way, in that. Uh, then in verse 24 to 28, it goes up to Gad. Gad is alongside the Jordan River between Galilee and uh, the Dead Sea, or the Salt Sea. So it mentions Gad. And then it goes up north by the uh, Galilee, would be the half-tribe of Manasseh, large territory promised to them. So it starts at the bottom, Reuben, Gad, half of Manasseh. And it mentions Og of Bashan, who was their king, 60 cities. He was, he was uh, known as one of the giants, and he had a huge territory, and he was a formidable king there. And in verse uh, 32 of chapter 13, it says, They gave the children of Israel a bad... Oh, I'm in numbers, sorry. We're going to turn there in a minute. Chapter 13 of Joshua. These are the areas which Moses had distributed as an inheritance in the plains of Moab on the other side of the Jordan by Jericho eastward. But to the tribe of Levi, Moses gave no inheritance. The Lord God of Israel was their inheritance, as he said to them. It just repeats that about Levites all the time. It's just a, 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 something we need to think about, right? That's why it's repeated. So it moves to the west now in chapter 14. All the, the other tribes, nine and a half tribes, on the west side and what they get for an inheritance. Uh, verse 1 of chapter 14, I'll read through verse 5. These are the areas which the children of Israel inherited in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest, Joshua the son of Nun, and the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel distributed as an inheritance to them. Their inheritance was by lot, as the Lord had commanded by the hand of Moses for the nine tribes and the half tribe. For Moses had given the inheritance of the two tribes and the half tribe on the other side of the Jordan. But to the Levites, he had given no inheritance among them. It's everything we've been talking about. For the children of Joseph were two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. So Jacob had 12 sons. Joseph uh, was the second to youngest than Benjamin, right? So Joseph had two sons, and that's Ephraim and Manasseh. So now you've got 13, because Joseph wasn't given the inheritance. His sons were. They were the ones blessed with the inheritance. Ephraim and Manasseh, they became a tribe, each of them, but really they're like the tribe of Joseph. So now you've got 13, but Levites don't get a lot of territory. They get those cities. So now you're back to 12. <laughs> it's interesting. But anyhow, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh, Levites, no, no land. Uh, 
except the cities to dwell in with their common lands for their livestock and their property as the Lord had commanded Moses. So the children of Israel did, and they divided the land. How did they do this dividing of the land? Well, it's, it's the tradition goes in uh, ancient Israel, uh, Jewish, Jewish legend would be that they had two urns, and then in one they would put all the names of the tribes. Okay, you're gonna. We're talking about the twelve tribes. Levites aren't going to go in there, and the name Joseph's not in there. Ephraim and Manasseh are, or half of Manasseh. So they put the nine and a half in the urn, and then they put the lot, of uh, the lots in the other one, and they draw one out, and they draw the other out, and that would be the tribe and what they got. So it's the idea was lottery. So that's just the idea of of what possibly uh, they did as a way of of getting that inheritance you know and and you think oh man i that's not the land i wanted i was hoping it was over here or over there but it's amazing how god actually divinely orchestrated the pulling out of those names and the pulling out of which territory when you look back at genesis chapter 49 there's 50 chapters in genesis genesis 49 has uh, jacob blessing the tribes blessing his sons and he blesses uh, Judah. Judah is going to be a lawgiver. A scepter will not depart from Judah. Well, Jerusalem is the area Judah gets. Judah gets this huge portion, this great blessing, you know, and, and we'll look at their the territory right here. But then, you know, you look at uh, Ephraim and Manasseh because Joseph gets a huge blessing. So Ephraim and Manasseh get this giant, huge portion, you know, and so it's, it's interesting. And then the other ones have theirs. So I'm, I'm not so sure that God wasn't involved. Of course he was. He was involved in the choosing of these lands and organizing it as well as they're drawing it by lot. And they're trusting that God is doing that work, right? Um, so these Levites have their, their portion separate. But we, we do sometimes think it's by uh, chance, you know, like our lot in life, you know, like it's rolling the dice. We didn't choose when and where we'd be born. Did you choose where and when you'd be born? No. Did you choose what skin tone you'd have? No. Did you choose uh, any any of the 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 um, you know biological distinctives, the you know, uh, traits that you would have? You didn't choose those. But we believe the Lord did because He knit us in our mother's womb. It says in Acts chapter, I think it's um, seventeen, and Paul is preaching and he says that God has pre-appointed our boundaries and our dwelling places. God has pre-appointed when and where we would live. Why? So that we might know him. So God has put everybody in a specific place and time to know him. Isn't that incredible? And that we might long for him and know him. No one's going to be blaming God. Well, if I was born over there, I would have sought you. I would have followed you. No one's going to get to have that opportunity to complain about about their lot in life to God because the reality is God will show them no you know it was what was chosen for you and from our perspective you know it may seem like chance rolling of the dice and so forth random you know uh, that, that what is what is my life about and so forth and we get very negative maybe but again God is directing these. And, and so it's interesting to watch. Watch this. And we'll come back to that idea at the conclusion here. In verse 6, there is this great interruption. In verse 6, there's this beautiful, in chapter 14 of Numbers, this interruption of, of Caleb. So the lots are being given out, and Caleb steps up, and follow with me in Joshua 14, 6. Then the children of Judah came to Joshua and Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. So you'd have to go back and read about that in uh, Numbers and in Deuteronomy. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, be afraid. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. And this is talking about back in Numbers 13, uh, where 
they were sent as spies. So they got out of Egypt, and within a couple years, they're sent out as spies. They're ready. They're at the border before the 40 years of wilderness wandering takes place. And so who gets picked? One head of every tribe, one, one spy from every tribe, special forces here. Caleb gets picked for Judah. And Caleb gets to go as Judah's representative to go spy out the land. And Joshua gets picked as well. And so Joshua and Caleb are younger at this point. They get to go spy out the land and they return from spying out the land. And they came back to Moses and Aaron and they told them, Man, it truly flows with milk and honey. It's full of fruit. But the people who dwell on the land are strong. The cities are fortified. They're large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites, Canaanites. They buy the sea, the banks of the Jordan. So they got to look around the land quite a bit. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession. Caleb got the conch. He got control of the the meeting and said, let's go. Confidence in his heart. For we are able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. They're leaving something out of that equation, aren't they? And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, the, Lord, uh, the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. All the people of whom we saw in it are men of great stature. We saw the giants there. The descendants of Anak came from the giants. We were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. So all the congregation lift up their voice. They cried. The people wept that night. And they complained to Moses, Oh, let's go back to Egypt. Die in the wilderness. Die in Egypt even. This is horrible. Uh, why has the Lord brought us out here? And so forth. And let's choose a new leader. <laughs> they say, But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who spied out the land, tore their clothes. They spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we passed through to spy out is exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only don't rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land. They are our bread. Their uh, protection has departed from them. The Lord is with us. That's the equation that they weren't bringing in, the other guys. Don't fear them. And all the congregation said, okay, let's go. No, they didn't. They said, stone them with stones. Kill these guys right now. With Pick up stones and kill them. The ones who wanted to go in. Who? Joshua and Caleb. The ones who survived. The ones who are the ones who get to go in. Right? And now we're at that point in reading about that. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle and so forth. And, and it goes on from there. It's intense. It's such an intense story. What goes on there? Caleb, let us go up at once and take it, for we are able. So, going back now to Joshua chapter 13. Here's Caleb. The inheritance is being given out, and Caleb comes into that meeting in Gilgal, which is like home turf for them. After they go out, they come back to Gilgal. Um, and Caleb says, remember the promise that was given to me about my inheritance. I wholly followed the Lord. In verse 9, Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot is trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. So Moses gave Caleb a specific promise. In Deuteronomy chapter 136, it was given there, uh, repeated there, Save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. He shall see it, and to him I will give the land that he has trodden upon, and to his children, because he hath wholly followed the Lord. In Numbers chapter 32, verse 11 and 12, Surely none of the men that came up out of Egypt from 20 years old and upward shall see the land which I swear unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me, save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, and Joshua, the son of Nun, for they have wholly followed the Lord. There's only two old guys in all Israel at this time, Joshua and Caleb. And Caleb comes up, he was obviously easy to identify, and... Caleb was one who had wholly followed the Lord. By the way, that, that term is repeated about Caleb six times. Three right here in Joshua 14. Holy follow the Lord. And it's it's W-H-O-L-L-Y. It's not H-O-L-Y. It's not because Caleb himself was so holy in and of himself. No, it was that he was 
absolutely sold out on fire. Caleb believed with all his heart. Caleb was not reserved in his heart about who God is and what God had for his people. Caleb didn't have any reservations. He wasn't holding anything back in his life to God. God, you have it all. And I believe you before I believe anybody else, whatever they're going to say. And yeah, he had friends who wanted to stone him for it. He had friends who, who, who hated him because of, of his passion for the Lord. But here is Caleb now. And, and he was all in with a total surrender. You know, there was no other way for him to be, no other way for him to live. There was no other, um, no other God in his life but the Lord God. He didn't have any idols. There was no other gods before the Lord, the first commandment. He loved him with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. It was clear. And, and you know, either it was real or not. And I think about that sometimes. Either this book is real or it's not. Either God's real or it's not. I remember thinking about that when I first became a believer in Jesus. If this is real, what am I doing? I used to say to myself. If this is real, if God's real, then, and I'd, we'd have to make some conclusions. And that's an awesome way to live. I get to have joy. I get to look at things and think, God's amazing. Whether it's any, any study of anything, because now I know the Creator. You know, and if God makes promises, oh, come on. He's, 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 he's going to fulfill his promises. And Caleb is, is, man, he's just got a whole heart. So verse 12, and back in Joshua 14, uh, sorry, verse 10. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive. He didn't die with that generation of unbelief. He has kept me alive as he said. See, these 45 years Ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while well, Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now here I am this day, 85 years old. So I slipped up last week and I was talking about maybe the age of Caleb, da 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 da, da and I was referencing 14 and stuff like that. Uh, so obviously Caleb was 40 years old. He probably spent 38 years uh, born a slave in Egypt, raised in, as a slave. And then Caleb gets to be part of that generation crossing the Red Sea, going in. And he, he was obviously a man of faith, and he was chosen as one of the spies at 40 years old. And, and then he goes and gets to see the land and comes back with a good report, believes in faith, but no one else believes in faith. That whole generation, so Caleb has to spend 40 years wandering in the wilderness until the last of that generation dies, save himself and Joshua. He saw all of his companions die in unbelief. Isn't that wild? And then he gets to go in with this new generation. And it takes five years to go, for them, five or so, to go conquering the land. The land's give, being given out. The inheritance is being given out. Caleb comes in to that meeting. And he plays his trump card. He says, mine's not by lot. I have a receipt here. And I'm cashing it in. His is not going to be by dice. His was given to him as an absolute promise from Moses. The place that you trod your feet, the place that you went there, that is yours. And he, when they got to go into land, his eyes must have been on it. He must have been, he, he wanted that. He yearned for that. He longed for that. And he's 85 years old. He held on to the promise of God for 45 years. I don't feel like waiting. We've got a lot of lines lately, right? You know, wait there. I went. I was going to the bank the other day, and you know, oh, I got stopped at the door. Stop. You know, go back to the line on the curb or whatever. I'm, All right, go back to the line on the curb. You know, waiting and so forth. You know, 45 years he's waiting for God's promise. 45 years. And what does God do here? Like, it's time has come for it to go out. So again, what does he do? Does going on to verse 13 in a minute here? Does does Caleb say, oh? You know, I'm 85 now. And, you know, that, that pasture over by Galilee looks really pleasant. I'm going to go retire there. Does, does Caleb say, you know, I just like the beach. I'm going to Gaza, you know. I, I, I like Tel Aviv. I'm going there to the beach. And I'm just going to suntan the rest of my days. I'm tired. What does he do? What does he do? It's amazing. He says, give me that mountain. That's what he says. He says, I, I want 
this territory here. He says in verse 11, As yet I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war. Both for going out and for coming in. Now therefore, verse 12, Joshua 14, Give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you heard in that day how the Anakim were there, and that their cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. It may be. I want to keep seeing God do awesome things. That's his heart. I want to keep seeing God move in my life. I want to keep seeing God do mir miracles. And I am ready. I feel as strong now at 85 as I was at 40, he says. And I want that mountain. That's what I want, and I'm after it. I'm ready. As today, think about the hunger in this man. The hunger for the things of God. To have the victories of God. To take God at his word. It's just awesome. Caleb, listen to this. He was a Kenizzite. What's a Kenizzite? From Genesis chapter 36, it talks about the families of Esau. Esau was the brother of Jacob. But Esau was disinherited, basically. And Kenaz was a chief of Edom. And from him, he was spoken of quite a bit there, came the Kenizzites. In other words, Caleb's not one of the, he's not one of the 12 tribes. He's not, he's not a Jew. But he's of their brethren, extended down the line. So somewhere along the line, his family must have gone down during the famine years, possibly, of Joseph down to, down to Egypt. And somewhere along the line, his family integrated with Judah because he gets to have inheritance with Judah and became that spy as a man of faith from Judah. But you've got to get that. He was brought in as a foreigner, adopted in. And here, here he is in, in Numbers chapter 14, 22, and 24. God shall, tells again the children of Israel they're not going up. And here's what God says. Because all these men who have seen my glory and the sign which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness have put me to the test now these ten times, and have not heeded my voice, they certainly shall not see the land which they swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. But, but my servant Caleb. He speaks in a broad, generalizing context of all those unbelieving, but then he speaks in name. But my servant Caleb, this is the Lord speaking, because he has a different spirit in him, and has followed me fully, wholly followed the Lord. I will bring him into the land where he went, and his descendants shall inherit it. Man, who was this man trusting implicitly? He had faith. Let's go take it. You know? No, stone him. That, so the fathers have done, that, that, that Stephen says in Acts 7, always stone the prophets, always stone those who had tremendous faith, who believed, right? And they were counted as the off-scouring of the world. They were counted as the nothing of the world. God counts Caleb as the something. You know, and, and yet these guys, anyway. You know, some say that his name means dog, Caleb. And Caleb means dog, but apparently in the Hebrew it's not C-A-L-E-B, it's C-E-L-E-B. And, and, and his name may be dog, and people are like, why would his name be, why would his parents name him dog? Oh, because he was not a Jew, he's a kid. Was like, oh, you dog. That's a pretty harsh thing and so forth, and people can draw some applications from that in his lineage. Uh, I don't think his parents would have named him dog, that's kind of weird, <laughs> but I don't know. The, the, there's another idea that, that's pretty amazing. See, the vowel is different with the C, E, or C, A. If it's, and it's the way it's pronounced, Caleb. Now, someone, someone said that maybe some interpreters uh, would have changed his name from Caleb, uh, Caleb to Caleb. Because Caleb means what? Caleb means dog, or Caleb which is how it's pronounced, means whole-hearted, fully devoted, or faithful. Isn't that awesome? Here's this whole-hearted one. And God sees him as whole-hearted, whatever the world might see him as. Right? He's whole-hearted. 85. I'm not taking my lot. I'm taking my inheritance, and my inheritance is that mountain, and I'm as strong today as I was then, and I want to see God do ma amazing things. And I believe if God's with us, we'll see. We'll go take them out. So Caleb is the only one. You look at all the tribes. They didn't all, none of them took their full inheritance. 
when you look at all the, the borders and boundaries and peoples and God was to be with them, Caleb is the only one that fully drove out those in his lands and took the full inheritance. Isn't that amazing? Only one that was able to do that. 45 years. So in chapter 14, again in Joshua, verse 13, Joshua blessed him. He gave him Hebron, uh, Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, to this day because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron formerly was Kirjath Arba. Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. The land had rest. Then the land had rest for more. Now Kirjath, uh, Kirjath means fortified. So when you see that before a city, so it was fortified city of Arba, Arba being the greatest of the Anakim, father of, uh, of these Anak, of the Anakim, the mightiest of them. So Kiriath or Kirjath Arba, uh, this fortified city there. This became Hebron, Hebron, a major and important city. Hebron is, is really interesting. But there would have been rooted evil going on there uh, for, for generations. Even though the city was begun by Abraham, basically, Abraham bought that parcel of land. That's the Hebron is where Abraham purchased it. Okay, Israel purchased land uh, 4,000 years ago there. And, and we have documents of that. And so somewhere in the mix, Anakim and them down in when, when Joseph was in Egypt, they took over and they bred there and it was just, who knows, genetics, DNA modification, weird stuff spiritually going on, very occultic. But uh, trying to pervert the human race probably. But it says right there at the end of verse 15 in chapter 14, and then the land had rest from war. Now that's interesting. Because at the end of chapter 11, the very end, in chapter 11, verse 23, it says that it's the same phrase, then the land had rest from war. It says it right after speaking about the Anakim. In chapter 11, chapter 11, Anakim this, Anakim that, then the land had rest from war. Chapter 14, Caleb, taking Hebron, where the head of the Anakim was, then the land had rest from war. It doesn't say that after the 31 puny kings compared to these guys. It doesn't say that elsewise. It says that after it speaks about these guys. Then it had rest from war. Interesting. When you look at that inheritance of Caleb, uh, of Israel, again, and Caleb's the only one that takes what he had here. Hebron was what he wanted. Again, Abraham put up his tents at the oaks of Mamre. Hebron. Abraham purchases that land, Genesis 23. And the first parcel of land owned by Israel. That's it. That's what he wanted. I want that back. This is where Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, and Rebekah, Jacob, and Leah all buried in Hebron. Caleb knew what he wanted, no question. And he went after it. And I suggest that he knew with such conviction because he was totally sold out. It says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Caleb was not a double-minded man, wholly following the Lord. The promise of God was good enough for him. He didn't need a bunch of other influence. The promise of God was what he had, and that's what he went on. A man of a different spirit. You know, I think about that term in Numbers 14 and 23 or whatever it is, a man of a different spirit. The Lord says that about him. And that's what we need. We don't need um, different sound equipment. We don't need different worship songs. We don't need different um, buildings or different accoutrements. We, don't, we, don't, we need a different spirit. We need the spirit of God. A different spirit from this world. A different spirit from the unbelieving, God-hating world. Jesus loves mankind. God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus said that a man must be born again, not, not born back into a mother's womb. No, born of the Spirit. That's what we need. That's what I need. That's what everyone needs. And here was Caleb, a man of a different spirit, going against the grain, going against his peers, and for 45 years waiting on the promises of God. And then once those promises came, he was wholehearted to go after it with all his heart. 
everything he had on fire for the things of God. I was uh, listening to someone talk about George Mueller. George Mueller, living in England some odd years ago, 100 or something, he started a ministry in England for orphans. He had nothing. He had like whatever it was, five plates, four forks. <laughs> he had nothing. And but God told him, and he knew in his heart, he had to start this ministry for orphans. And he never asked, he wouldn't ask for anything except on his knees in prayer. He wouldn't tell people what he needed. And God would bring it to him. He ended up caring for over 10,000 orphans with five huge buildings and staff and so forth. And he would only ask in prayer. George Mueller was sickly his whole life. And he wanted to be a missionary. And he was turned down five times by different missionary boards. No, you can't go. This reason, that reason, or whatever. When he was 70 years old, he said, I'm going anyways. And he went from 70 years old to 87 years old. He traveled over 200,000 miles without airplanes. 200,000 miles on horseback, on ship, on carriage. And he would preach. He preached six over 6,000 times in those years. And if you do the math at about 300, say he preached 300 days a year, it, it works out to 20 years, you've got about 6,000. So he's preaching nearly every day, traveling 200,000 miles. He preached the word in 42 different countries. And when he was 90, he was still preaching six times a week and working every day. He, he, yet he was sickly his whole life, he, outliving his, his doctors, I'm sure. So here's a man of a different spirit. And through, you know, through the centuries, you find those people, men of a different spirit, people of a different spirit. You know, we have the life and we have the lot God gives us. What are we going to do with it? I want that one over there. I would rather have that one. And, and next week I'll talk more about that, I think, as an application. But the Lord's been speaking to me. This is the life I've given you. And I only have today. I don't have another day. I've got now and my time is precious. And this is the lot God's given me. What am I going to do with it? Am I going to wholly follow the Lord? Am I going to complain? Am I going to tuck tail and hide? Am I going to live by faith? What am I going to do with it? And the, and the Lord's just showing me to live by his spirit. And what a picture of, of living for the Lord we have in Caleb. When you know that, you know, your lot has been given to you by God. You have to believe that by faith, first of all. That's what it says in the Bible. I already quoted it. Where he pre-appointed your boundary and your dwelling place. He knew, he knew who you'd be and when and where you'd live. And, and when, when you accept that and you, you begin, and you say, instead of saying, man, couldn't you have given me something else? Instead of saying, thank you, Lord. Thank you, say that. Thank you. I believe those dice are loaded. You know, you wouldn't want that if you were going to play some some game at a casino or something. You don't want loaded dice. But when it comes to the Lord, you sure do. You, you want the Lord behind that. And he is behind that. Caleb was the son of Jephuna. He could have lived his whole life. Man, why couldn't I have been born into that tribe and been a real Israelite? Why is my name Dog or whatever you knows, right? But he's not living that way. And... Jesus came preaching and teaching the kingdom of God. He was of a different spirit. He had an authority that, that was unlike the scribes and the Pharisees. Jesus was of a different spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. He said, I only do that which pleases the Father. Always do that which pleases the Father. He had a mission regardless of what everybody else thought and said. He had a purpose. And it's of his spirit we have received. Jesus knew what he wanted. He wanted that pearl of great price. That pearl of great price, his bride, you and I, all who believe in him through faith. In his death and his resurrection, Jesus went after that and he would pour out his soul to the last for that, for us. He went after that. Nothing could divert him from that mission. And so, Jesus, what a, what a picture of, of the best 
you know, it's it's not Caleb. It's I, I'm not trying to be a better Caleb. I'm going to look to a better Caleb. And a better than Caleb is Jesus, who, who in all ways did that which pleases the Father. And I trust in Jesus. And now in Jesus, we have an inheritance that is made without human hands. We have an inheritance that far surpasses anything we could imagine. And we'll look at more into that next week. Lord, we thank you that uh, we have an inheritance in you. And Lord, that's what we want. I pray, God, that you would fill us with the Holy Spirit. I pray that, God, you would help us to understand that we can walk by the Spirit, not in the flesh. Lord, help us to uh, give you praise and worship when we feel like being uh, depressed or we feel like navel-gazing or something else, Lord. Just lift up our countenance. Lord, may we see you. May we see that, God, you've got good things prepared for those who love you. That, Lord Jesus, that uh, no weapon formed against us will prosper. That, Lord, we can take and, and move forward in the promises you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you peace. Amen.